Louise Bedford here, your host of the Talking Trading podcast. This is where traders excel. I wanted to kick off with a story going back many, many years now. I was personally training a trader. He was in the police force. He only told me his name was Minnow. He wouldn't give me his full name and the reason will become apparent in just a moment. He was an expert chameleon. He was able to blend in with the crowd and he tells me that he has been living with drug dealers. Now, how it all eventuated was I'm training him with trading. He's telling me a bit about his life and eventually I just couldn't get enough. And it was like watching an underbelly episode because he would feed me this information and I would hear it and go, wow, that's such a different life. Minnow eventually was killed by the people that he was living with. And I'll give you the interim shot on this. He found that because he was living with them and he was immersed in their world, he was so involved and so caring towards who he considered his brothers and so on with the goals of that group that he no longer felt that he was separate. And when it came time for him to convict one of those people in particular, it ruined him. It totally made him realize that he was so entrenched that he had become one of them and he was putting away somebody who he considered to be a brother. Now, it was incredibly tragic and I could see it happening before my eyes, but I have to say this is the power of wearing tracts in our brain. We train our brain consciously and unconsciously to create different outcomes. And that is why I have invited Rick Schnabel back onto the show. Rick is known as the great brain untrainer. Now, I'll introduce you properly in just a moment, Rick. But what are your thoughts about Minnow's experience? I can completely get a sense of why he would have experienced that final undoing. Because one thing that we certainly are is we are rapport builders. We, we, we just do rapport. It, it becomes our prime focus whenever we connect socially. And the opposite to that is when we're breaking rapport or not getting rapport, we feel like we're an outcast. We feel like we're not part of the group. So it's really important for us to feel like we are part of a group. And there are so many ways in which we do that. Someone smiles, you smile back. Someone puts their thumb up, you put your thumb, thumb up in return. Someone puts their hand up, you give them a high five. And these are elements of rapport that we do very, very easily. So typically when we are being born, we become very alike or com sometimes completely opposite to our mother and father. And around what is known as the modeling period, when we start getting into our teenage years, typically we'll make one of the most crucial decisions to our lives. We will choose someone that we want to become more like and we will dress like them, talk like them, act like them and be like them. So rapport is really quite key to us as people, but many people don't realise this consciously. Mm, I think you're right. And it is something we can take control over. Now, Rick, your website is lifebeyondlimits.com.au. I've read so many of your books. I do think of you as the brain untrainer. Some of your books have dealt with this particular topic, but I want to talk about trading and how we can train our brains consciously. So perhaps you could give me your perspective first. Do you feel that it is possible to retrain your brain? Oh, Absolutely, definitely. It is certainly something that anybody can do. And the truth is that a little bit in the context of what you were sharing, you know, with the story about Minnow, it's that same thing that we associate with people around us, which make us train entrained. You know, we become entrained in a way that we think in a certain way. I was having a conversation with someone recently and we were talking about the educational system. And the educational system in America, for, extent, uh, for example, was essentially 
it was designed so people got jobs. It was designed so people could fill the industrial revolution with lots of factory workers and, and people in offices and so forth. However, there's a distinction that the Australian system was designed a little bit differently in that it was designed so the children of convicts didn't go out and replicate their parents' lives. So what they did essentially, if you, you look at the school system, it is actually no different to the prison system. It has many of the ingredients that condition our thinking. So the only difference is they let you out after three o'clock, <laughs> whereas the prison system, you stay in, you stay incarcerated. So we line up, we stand up when we're told to stand up, we eat when we're told we can eat. We go to the toilet when we're told we can go to the toilet. We put our hands up, you know, to get attention. We wear a uniform. We stand in line. You know, the whole yes, sir, whatever you say, please, ma'am, thank you, ma'am, all of these sorts of traits that we are taught through primary school actually imprisons us. So we are really taught to be imprisoned without a shadow of a doubt. If we, if we want to live a life that is free, if we want to create a bigger opportunity in our lives, we actually have no choice, but we have to untrain our brain. Mm. It is interesting that I'd never compared prison and school but i have two children as you know and my youngest has got a little bit of the touch of the rebel in her <laughs> there is no doubt yeah. she will push a boundary which i have to say i have been encouraging i suggest to her sure you can skip that class nobody's saying you have to go you're in year 10 11 12 the, i mean you're allowed to get out of school at that age so the thing is though you have to consider the consequences. If you get caught, what are the consequences and can you live with them? So that is one of the things I think as traders we must be aware of as well. We are pursuing that brain training so that we can follow our trading plan. But if we break our rules, are we prepared to live with the consequences? And I think that knowledge, the ability to examine and to be introspective is such an important aspect. Do you feel introspection has a critical role for traders? I think introspection has a critical role for every single level of achievement on the planet. People who really tend to achieve really know themselves well. Like I, I go back to the story that you were sharing about your daughter, about being a little bit of a rebel. In order to be a little bit of a rebel, you've got to be so comfortable in your skin that you're willing to step outside of the norms because we see so much in our world whenever people step outside of the norms, they are typically shunned and they're, they're, they're pushed away or held at arm's length. So that takes an extraordinary amount of power to be able to stand in your power even though you're not fully accepted into the group. So it is often the rebels that are the ones that often achieve because they are willing to stand in their power where everyone else needs the collective group to get their power. Mm, I like that too, because I wonder also, is it to do with evolutionary biology that women actually often have more difficulty getting outside those boundaries and pushing those boundaries? And I, I'm guessing it's because in the caves, way back when in our past, we would have been kicked out as women and so would our children and that would have meant a certain starvation and death. So at some visceral level, we are holding on to this inherited pain that if we outsource the thoughts to somebody else, they make the decisions for us, we're kept down a little bit, but at least we're safe. If we follow the rules, at least we don't get kicked out of the cave. and. I do think that my generation and the generations to come 
after me, we are the first ones to really tackle this. I mean, really in this country, women have only just started being able to buy their own houses in their name, get their own credit card, get their own passport without the ability of a brother or a guardian or a father or a husband to say yes or no. What are your thoughts about gender versus brain untraining? Well, I think that you're right in the context of women have certainly been corralled to fit certain social norms and they have, again, it's that element of rebellion. They've broken through and, and women today, like if you're a woman and you think by being a woman you are less than a man in any way, that is so skewed. That is so wrong. And, and many people now know that. So this is a new knowing level. The next level of knowing is application and living it and being it and fully em- embracing it. But the thing, and I just want to go back to the, the element of the caves, there has been an enormous amount of science that actually has concluded that we didn't evolve from the caves. So Darwin's theory of the strongest will survive is flawed as well, that um, we actually, as a human being, we have not evolved all that much at all for literally thousands of years. The things that has evolved is our technology, our fashion, and our environment, you know, our architecture. They're the only three things that have really evolved. Thinking is very much still the same. You know, many people still get corralled, although there have been social ideas and concepts that have developed. Yes, you know, women have more right now. Kids, too, have more right. Skin colour has as much right as any anyone else, but yet... We've still got wars going on in the world. We've still got racism happening. We've still got segregation going on. We've still got, you know, demeaning type uh, principles and values going on within the world. But socially as a collective, many of us are saying that's not acceptable anymore. So, so we have evolved in that particular sense. But, Thank goodness. Uh, my gosh. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but the thing is that there is something very unique in us that science has discovered within our DNA, there is a thing called a pinch. And in other words, our DNA strands, there is a, there is a very small piece. It's about, you know, a, a very small portion of a very long DNA code that has been attached to our DNA, which is responsible for the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex gives us elements such as empathy, understanding, collaboration, communication, connection, and all of these sorts of things. And this is where the opportunity for brain untraining kicks in because we can actually even defy our own DNA when we tell ourselves new stories. And these stories can start to become very, very true in our mind's eye. And, you know, I remember in another program, we were talking about vision, pictures, and how important it is. Like, as you were sharing your initial story, your eyes were just constantly going up into visual remembered. So you were grabbing all these pictures, you know, of Minnow and all the things that you experienced through that time to be able to retell that story. So it's almost like we have this massive archive of pictures, you know, within our, within our prefrontal cortex. And so what happens is we pull down these pictures and then we piece them together. It becomes our movie. And we are a major character in that movie. And we show up as Clint Eastwood or or we show up as, you know, whoever it may be, Marilyn Monroe, or we, we, we show up as, you know, Aaron Brockovich, you know, and, and that becomes our personality, our character forms our identity. And we will stay true to that plus or minus 15%. We will not defy our identity unless we untrain that identity and shift that identity. But it's that little pinch in our DNA that is extraordinary. Like we can do amazing things. We can change in such profound ways. 
Yeah. And isn't it interesting that regardless of who you are and where you're at, that the capability for you to be able to shift is within your control. What do you think about age though and IQ? Are there difficulties if somebody is either too old or too young with retraining their brain and some people don't feel equipped from an IQ level to do this? Yeah, I, I think firstly let me address the age component. The We have a concept that age is linear that we degenerate over time, but that's not completely true. Age is actually cyclical, not linear. In other words, you can be healthier at an older age than you were at a younger age, just by changing your diet, changing your exercise, changing your mindset, changing your behaviors, your habits, your values, your destiny, your purpose, all those sorts of things. So, so what you can actually, What you can actually do from an age perspective is you can advance your thinking. You can improve your memory. You can, you know, forget Alzheimer's, forget some of these sorts of things. You can shift your diet. You can pull toxins out of your body. And it's typically the toxins that are causing most of these problems anyway. So from an age perspective, there is no limit, really. Now, from a gender perspective, Equally, there is no limit. You know, the the female mind is just as amazing as the male mind and Vicky Verko. You know, the, we have extraordinary brains. You know, gender at the end of the day is, is really just a concept mostly. Sure, there's different physiology, there's different brain patterns, but it's a concept mostly. And it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, this element of rapport. You know, the women want to be like the women. The men want to be like the men. You know, there's the aspirational. There's the, there's the other part where we, you know, compare ourselves and think we're superior and so forth. But what we do is mostly how we show up is a concept. It's a concept we hold in our mind and it really determines how we show up and who we show up as and what we actually think is possible for us, what we can and what we can't do. Mm, And IQ? IQ at the end of the day actually can be a limitation. And I know this might not be a great frame to begin with, but uh, hear me out here. IQ, if we think about that, there's, there's a few elements of IQ. There's memory. And if we think about most of our educational system, it's really based on memory. It's actually, you know, through your educational uh, experience, we actually weren't ever taught to think. We weren't ever taught to, to produce better thinking. We were taught to remember. You know, it was very much a case of here's a bunch of data. Take it. I'm going to throw it at your head. And we're going to see how much of it sticks. And then we're going to measure how much of it sticks by percentage. And then we're going to give you a score. And the whole educational system is very much about that. But very, very little work has gone into the cognitive process of thinking, like what underpins the thinking? You know, what is the metacognition that determines the thinking? And that is far more valuable. So, In the context of IQ, which is all the stuff we remember, often gets in our way. Like, for example, so many people, over the years I've coached so many people, and I find that the more scientific someone becomes, the more highly invested in IQ someone becomes, the more concrete they are and the more rigid they are and the more immovable they are. So when I'm aiming to untrain their brain, they will often fight me. And they will, it, it, it's a Richard Bach who wrote that fantastic book, Illusions and A Bridge Across Forever and all those beautiful books. He said at one point, he said that if you argue for your limitations, you get to keep them. And that's what I find sometimes people with very high IQ can actually do. That is gold. I just wanted to underline that. If you argue for your limitations, you get to keep them. Oh, I love it. 
It's a, it was a beautiful quote by Richard Bach. It's, uh, it is gold, absolutely. Yeah, I actually think with the trading arena, you have to be smart enough to be able to write your trading plan, but then dumb enough to follow it without question. Yeah. So I don't think when we're talking about the bell curve of human intellect, that there are many people that are excluded from trading. So the plus with this, Rick, is I'm loving that you are stripping away our excuses. So age is no barrier, gender is no barrier, IQ is no barrier, that everything that you're talking about is a, approachable for every single individual, which I think is just really refreshing. Well, if you think about it, over the years, Something, I'll explain a personal story. For me, when I was, I think I was seven years old, I remember being in class and, you know, rich novels, stand up and do your eight times tables. And, you know, again, prison system, you know, so I stand up in my uniform. I, you know, I acquiesce to the commands and I start my eight times tables. Now, I believe that me and mathematics were not that, were not best friends, and that I, as a result of this, was not smart. So here I am, you know, with my, you know, one's eight is eight, two eights are 16, and I couldn't get beyond 16. I couldn't hit the 24. And then I started counting on my fingers, stop counting on your fingers, you know, like do not use your assets, do not use your tools, you know, and that's literally what they're saying. And so... In this moment, I lost two loves. I lost the love of mathematics and I lost, lost the love of public speaking in that moment. Oof. And so I felt so dumb. Kids laughed. And, of course, the teacher embraced that because it's become, it becomes a useful tool. And so here I am going through my educational system thinking that I'm stupid and this became my prime belief system. So when I got into my first year of high school, I had a gorgeous mathematics teacher. And, you know, this is back in the days when they were probably about five years older than you, you know, and you're thinking, wow, she's hot. And, you know, so she's teaching me all this mathematics and her looks weren't helping. <laughs> and and so what I got to is I got to the first term parent-teacher interviews. My parents went to school and I could tell the result when I saw my father consoling my mother who was crying and I'm thinking, oh, my God, oh, my God, what have they said? And my mother was never really good at, you know, framing things. She just blurted it out. And she said, you know, your mathematics teacher, Mrs. Heels, I'll call her, says that you're stupid and you'll never amount to anything and you should get out of school as soon as you are legally able. You should get a trade and leave. You know, and this was, oh, my God, my secret is out. Everyone knows it now. My mum and dad know it. And, and so... I believe this right up until I was 35 years old and I was running an advertising agency and we were about to employ some people and what I was doing was using various formula, mathematical formula to find out when we employ this person, what percentage of work is he going to take away from everybody and what is that going to mean in a profitable dollars and cents? And here I am late at night in my agency working a very complex spreadsheet, mathematics, and I just had an epiphany. I thought, oh, my God, I am running a multi-million dollar advertising agency here that I built on mathematics and we have all our rates, our percentages, our ratios and all of this sort of stuff and I built it all on mathematics and I thought, I am not stupid. And I thought, where is my mathematics teacher now? Now, she actually ran off with a guy and went to live in Nimbin. Um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, the thing is that unfortunately we hear stories and that became a story. That story just kept repeating itself. And, you know, a lot of my friends will say, you are so clever, you are so clever. And, it, and I wouldn't hear that. 
it would defy that belief system. Mm. So what I had to do is I had to get into that belief system and erode it. I had to untrain it and I had to get beyond it because that limitation would come out in everything. It would come out in my study. It would come out in reading a book and, you know, how much of it will I remember? Am I smart enough? All that sort of nonsense. So we have to defy it sometimes. And even one step back is we have to become aware of it in the first place. Yes. I think for every trader listening that you have to question, what are the things holding me back? What are the things blocking me from money? Because those things are evil, my friend. You oh, yeah. deserve more than you are getting currently. So to be able to question that and to use those traits of metacognition, which is something I want to define in just a moment, I think it's really critical as a trader. Now, Rick, you did mention metacognition earlier. Metacognition is the ability to think about your own thoughts. And it's even one step further than introspection. It's creating a distance between our thought and us, who we are, our identity. And I think that can really make a difference for traders as well. How do you think traders can use metacognition to assist their trading results? Well, I think if if traders sat down and went through their typical process of trading, you know, their system, followed the system, and then they get to certain points of that system and they're going to perhaps have some difficulty. So to note that difficulty and then ask the question, why am I having that difficulty? What am I believing what do I think of myself? Do I believe I have the skills? Do I believe I have the smarts? Do I believe I can achieve? What is my, I, my end picture? Do I see myself really achieving here? And be able to get, you know, a pencil and start writing underneath those thoughts to find the origin of those thoughts. And Something that I often find is when I'm coaching and working with someone who's saying, I can't do this, or when I when this happens, I just don't have the skills or my mind shuts off or it freezes or whatever, I am no longer shocked that quite often what you're doing is you're working with that person and saying, when did you decide that you weren't smart, for example? And then what they'll do is they'll say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And that becomes a stuck point. So I've designed a process where basically I say, you do know. Let's find it. So what we have to do is we have to shut off our conscious thinking, shut off our senses, which are reinforcers that reinforce any level of thinking. It's what we see, what we taste, what we smell, what we touch, what we know, what we feel deep in our heart. These are the things that lock ideas in. So what we have to do is get, we have to open that lock. And so we close down and shut down our senses and we allow our unconscious mind, our brain to go to the very source of the problem. And I have done this thousands of times and I've never, ever found anyone not get to the thing. And you'll hear someone like if it were me, it would be, oh, my God, here I am. I mean, I'm seven years old. I'm, I'm, I'm being told to stand up and do my times tables. <gasps> no wonder. No wonder I think I'm stupid. Oh, Epiphany. my God. Yeah, <laughs> yes. absolutely. Yes. And, and so what you've got to do is you've got to rewrite your history and you, you've got to recode that little piece because that little piece is the seed that built an enormous tree and you've now got to chop down that tree and you've got to pull it out, roots and all, and you've got to get rid of that nonsense. Because that is when, when someone says, I'm not good at computers, go back to when did you decide that? Or I'm not good at trading, go back to when you decided that. Someone says that, you know, I, I don't think I'm ever going to be that financial. Go back, when did you decide that? And 
it will it won't be at that moment that they're sitting there in front of their computer going through a trading process it will be when they were 7 years old or 14 years old or something happened in school or someone said you you're a dummy or or you you'll never succeed da 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 etc cetera, etc cetera. and and what happens is these these events these are pictures these are feelings these are taste smells these are knowings and we we lock these in and they become a neural pathway in our brain that says this is who i am and that never will that ever change unless you question that source yeah rick so much of what you've said here is really resonating with me i think for everybody listening, we need to question where our original ideas about our self-concept came from and then crowbar those ideas open, see if there's any light that, that can get in so that we can really challenge those values and concepts that we thought were inherent in ourselves. Now, Rick, I've just got one other area that I'd like to ask you about, and that is FOMO, fear of missing out. This is a plague for traders. It is one of the difficulties if you talk your book, which means you're showing an open trade to another trader. That's a big no-no. We only show closed trades to our trading friends. It can be difficult for people to overcome because that jealousy and that ego, that double-headed snake of venom seems to crop up with FOMO. What would your advice be for traders trying to combat FOMO? Well, I think if you think about what actually, again, in the context of metacognition, what really brings about FOMO, and FOMO is often unrelenting grasping you know element where we're grasping where we've got to climb that ladder where we've got to be lauded and considered amazing and so what when we think about that there's usually a little boy or a little girl that just wanted to achieve and, and they believe the only way they're going to get there is by this, you know, in, insatiable neediness and graspiness to, to get to the top of that tree or to hit some sort of, you know, incredible way. Oh, my God, your gold Mercedes is just so amazing. You must be amazing. And interest, we've got to get rid of that nonsense, you know, this level of comparison, you know, when we compare against, you know, those that are doing really well and this level of superiority, you know, where we're saying, you know, I'm so much better than you. These do not help our communities. These do not help our families. These do not help us as individual people because what we're doing is there's this constant icky judgment that's going on. There's this constant superiority, which is arrogance. And we've, you know, some people say, but if I lose that, I'm going to lose my drive. Well, no, that's not true. Um, you can be inspired, though, by people who have achieved more than you. That is a different situation compared to what you're talking about, that negative comparison to people that are further ahead. Yeah, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it into our friendship. You know, like we've known each other for a long, long time. And, you know, every time we get together, I really enjoy the moments. We have incredible conversation. And, you know, I always feel lifted, you know, after leaving one of our breakfasts or something like that. I, I do. I honestly do. And the thing is that I cannot ever recall a conversation where we sat down and we compared our key tags you know what car do we drive or did we ever compare our houses or did we ever compare our net worth or anything along that line and nor have we had any level of competition about who's smarter or you know who's more successful or anything along that line it is what I would see as a collaboration, you know, that we're constantly applauding one another and we're constantly in awe of one another. And, and that's, a, in my view, that's a very healthy space to be because 
it, it fosters good connection. It fosters friendship. It fosters collaboration. And, and I think if, if all of society, you know, modelled, I'm not saying we're way up here and you should all model us. I'm not saying that at all. When we rule the world. <laughs> when we rule the world. <laughs> no, I think I'll leave that to someone else. But, but the thing is that, you know, I, I think that communities are better when we all appreciate the things that we do well and we don't compare ourselves to those. And, and if we take comparison and judgment out of the game, FOMO disappears. There is no need to be so hungry, you know, that you've got to put, you know, all that spaghetti and pasta on the plate. You know, what you can do is just savour the meal, just really enjoy the meal, enjoy the journey and enjoy yourself growing. You know, and I think there are many traders that have big visions, like I've met many of your wonderful, wonderful students that have beautiful visions of doing things like investing into land and just creating ecosystems that will not be built on and are just to create a sustainable corridor for animals and things like that. And they are the sorts of visions that there is nothing that speaks FOMO in those sorts of visions. It's just, I have a good intention. I want to do some good out there. And money is a very important part of that vehicle, you know, in achieving that. And, and I'm just going to keep moving along that line. It's such a hallmark of having a growth mindset, which should be the goal for everybody. Yeah. Rick, I have adored having you on the show yet again. You are just so special to me. Thank you for providing that open-minded vision for everybody listening to this episode. Rick, how can people get in touch with you? Best place to get in touch with me is Life Beyond Limits. There's a little contact page. You can, I think even my email is up there somewhere. So you can definitely get in touch with me via lifebeyondlimits.com.au. Magic. Thanks so much for your time, Rick. Thank you, Louise. As always, I love our time together. <laughs>